to start eating chili. Um, <laughs>
limited for Aaron, who faced an obscenely excessive prosecution before he killed himself, for Thomas Drake, who brought forth incredibly important revelations about NSA waste and corruption, and had his career ruined, and now works as a retail clerk in an Apple store, and barely escaped many decades in prison, or Jim Risen, who uncovered while the New York Times the first NSA scandal almost 10 years ago, and now faces threats of prison for refusing to identify his source who enabled him to do important journalism, or the list of whistleblowers who were prosecuted and are in prison, or Laura herself, who is in Germany because she's afraid to edit her own film in the United States, her own country, because she's afraid her own government will take her footage and impede her ability to do her film, or me in Brazil, because there are lots of people who believe that it's not safe for either Laura or I to return to our own country because of the journalism we're doing. It's a long and depressing list in, in, in one sense, an incredibly reflective of world of our political culture, and it doesn't say very much good. And yet, on the other hand, there's, I think, an encouraging irony to that list, namely that the list is as long as it is, and it's continuously getting longer. <clears throat> in other words, I think there's lots of tactics that the government uses to try and, as Laura said, intimidate and chill and deter people from meaningfully challenging it. And in a lot of cases, it does work. But in increasingly large numbers of cases, it doesn't work. I think what's actually happening is it's backfiring. The more people see how abusive the government is, the more emboldened they get and inspired they become to realize that the government needs real accountability and transparency. I think the government is actually sowing the seeds of these challenges against it, ironically, because the more thuggish uh, their persecution is, the more people are driven to want to challenge them and to see the need. And I think that's what's driven our work, that's what drove Edward Snowden, that's what drove the people on the list I just identified. I think it goes back all the way to my personal political hero, Danny Glasberg, who I know is in the audience, who I think was driven by the same and who inspired all of these people as well. So it's a depressing list, but I look at it as a very encouraging one as well. Um, there's definitely been a lot of challenges that we've encountered over the past several months in the work that we are doing. There's a huge challenge in trying to do journalism when you know that you're constantly being surveilled, when your communications are constantly being monitored. There's a huge challenge in deciding which information should be disclosed and which information ought not to be disclosed. There's a huge challenge in trying to deal with the threats um, and the attacks that come from every precinct. There's a huge challenge in trying to deal and, and work with large media institutions that can provide a platform to make these revelations heard and yet have a commitment to the kind of intrepid journalism and transparency that these documents require or would at least be pushed into having that commitment. These are really formidable challenges and yet for me they've been more or less easily navigable in large part because of how fortunate I've been with the two people with whom I've worked most extensively on these stories. The first of whom is Edward Snowden, um, whose act of conscience, pure conscience and self-sacrifice is really extraordinary and is something that will shape how I think and the choices that I make for the rest of my life. There's a lot of things I could tell you about Edward Snowden that I think reflect his character and the nature of the act that he has done. I don't recognize the public demonization campaign that has been predictably depicted um, around him. Um, but I just want to share one incident that's seemingly trivial and yet to me speaks volumes about a lot of profound and important things in this case. When the three of us, Laura, um, Edward, and I were in Hong Kong, for pretty much every single night, Laura and I were incapable of sleeping more than 90 minutes or two hours. Just a combination of the stress and the excitement and the adrenaline and the sense of achievement um, and all of the choices that were burdening us prevented us from sleeping. Um, and yet, every single night at around 10.30, like Hopper, um, Edward Snowden, both shortly before he was about to become the most wanted man on the earth and even after he became that, would say to us at exactly the same time, 
Well, guys, um, I think I'm gonna hit the hay. <laughs> he would go and he would disappear for eight and a half hours. Um, and he wouldn't see him again until like 6.30, 7 in the morning, completely well rested, sleeping through the whole night that he didn't have a care in the world. It was literally every night. And I remember at one point I said to him, I said, look, this is getting absurd. Like, why are you able to sleep so soundly? Um, when, you know, we were assuming that he was literally days away from being in U.S. custody and, and in prison for decades or, or on the run or, or some, something worse. Um, and at some point, sometimes he would try and joke it and he would say, well, I'm pretty sure this is the last week that I'm going to have a comfortable pillow, so I might as well enjoy it. <laughs> but, um, but ultimately what I realized is that he was an individual who was completely at peace with the choice that he had made. There was this equanimity that had descended over him and engulfed him by virtue of the fact that he had chosen a course of action out of pure conscience, pure conviction, pure passion, that what he was doing was the right thing to do morally and ethically for other people. And that was one of the most profound things for me to watch is the power that that kind of a choice can have, the peace and the power that can be generated when somebody makes a decision of that type and one of the things that I think will be most enduring about all of this, the lesson that will be learned from Edward Snowden, the reason that I think he's touched and inspired literally millions of people around the world, the reason why when I go to testify before the Brazilian Senate, there are a standing room only of college kids wearing Edward Snowden masks over their face, and this is a scene repeating itself all over the world, is because what he really stands for is the power of the individual to change the world, literally, uh, to change the world. And, uh, it really is an amazing thing to think about. He was somebody who was as ordinary as a guest. He had no position, no power, no prestige, no wealth. Um, and yet, simply by choosing to act in a principled and passionate way, a self-sacrificing and fearless way, he was able to stand up to and in many ways um, undermine uh, some of the world's most powerful factions, the ones we typically think of as being so formidable that they're sometimes invulnerable. It's an incredibly important and inspiring lesson that I think he taught all of us. The second person who I've been so fortunate to work with is Laura, um, who is easily one of the most brilliant and fearless people I've ever met. Um, she says that it's my bravery that inspires her, but honestly, it is the other way around. Um, this is, you know, somebody who has went to a war zone and purposely sought out the most dangerous place so that she could give voice to Sunni insurgents about why they were fighting this invading army. Um, she has an incredibly um, understated demeanor that masks this beast of bravery and passion lurking underneath it. Um, there really is this incredibly inverse relationship between her willingness to attract attention to herself and how crucial and vital the role she has played in every single thing that has happened over the last four months. I mean, we're really, the people in this room at this event are really blessed. We're sort of like lottery winners. We got to hear Laura Quaker speak in public, the rarest of Historically, like Van Alsberg, by um, our fellow co 
Carolina Reuters is a community that really emboldens and strengthens you, and far from making you feel lonely, makes you feel like the work that you're doing is really worthwhile and gives you that energy and strength to continue. Um, so the last thing I just want to touch upon is that um, as talented as the work has been, and as intensive as it has been, and has been all of those things, um, it's also been incredibly gratifying. And the reason for that is that I think for both myself and Laura, we're engaged in exactly the fight that we want to be engaged in. Uh, surveillance programs might be the least significant um, of the ultimate effects in the long run from this whole episode. I think the least as important is the worldwide debate that has taken place over how much we can trust those in political power to exercise that power in complete secrecy and with no accountability. I think as important is the thinking that people are now doing about the proper role of journalism with regard to states and political power, not to serve them and amplify their message, but to adversarially check what it is that they're doing. Um, and I think ultimately, most importantly, it has really raised the, the question that has been at the heart of EFF's work from the beginning, which is that the internet can be what it has always promised to be, which is this incredible, unprecedented tool of democratization and empowerment and liberalization. But it can also be the exact opposite. It can be the worst and most unprecedented weapon of control and oppression ever created in human history. And I really feel like we're at the crossroads. And the decision about where we go should not be made by tiny numbers of unaccountable people working within the national security bowels of the United States and the United Kingdom, but should be made by everybody affected in the world, which requires them to have an understanding of what it is that's being done. And it really is true that EFF has been at the forefront of that. There are huge numbers of people who work at that organization who give me counsel and incredibly wise advice and all kinds of support. I sleep better at night knowing that this organization exists. Um, and so I really want to thank EFF and all the people who work there every day and the people who support it um, in every way possible for the award that, that you've given to all myself and Laura and um, Jamie and Aaron. It really is a great honor and, and thank you so much for letting us come in and speak with you.